A lake in northeastern Canada harbors a legendary monster. The descriptions match those told by Native Americans of swimming demons and water devils. Eels longer than a canoe and strong enough to capsize a boat. We hear of stories of gigantic eels. Is it possible that something dreadful has made this lake its home? Or is this a local legend passed down for centuries? It's almost a, a badge of honor if you've seen it. A Monster Quest team dives into the icy murk to find out what slithers beneath and employs the latest technology to seek the truth about Lake Crescent's Something. monster eel. What the heck was that? Witnesses around the world report seeing monsters. Are they real or imaginary? Science searches for answers on Monster Quest. Robert's Arm, a fishing town nestled amid the rugged bays of Newfoundland's northeastern coast, is a seemingly peaceful place. But beneath the still black waters of majestic Lake Crescent, something is said to live as it has for untold years. I saw the head as it was kind of a long feature. There was no waves on either side. It was just a deep swell. It wasn't moving in the water, but it was, it had this tendency to, to be vibrating. The head was like long, pointy. It was dark. It was, I'd say, it was 30 feet long. Witnesses describe a serpentine creature, 20 to 40 feet long, with a snake-like head and featureless body. It most closely resembles an eel, but compared to any known eel, fresh or salt water, this is a monster. Sightings of similar phenomena are reported across Canada, from Lake Okanagan in British Columbia and Lake Manitoba in Manitoba, to Lake Memphromagog in Quebec on the Vermont border. But this is the first scientific investigation into the monster of Lake Crescent. Lake and ocean monsters have a long history. A Swiss naturalist, Conrad Gessner, was the first to try to classify these unknown giants. For two centuries, North American sailors have reported sea serpents all along the eastern seaboard. But the oldest accounts in this area come from stories passed down from the very first native settlers of this continent. If you talk to the Algonquins and you interview them, they talk about serpents. John Castleman, a biologist at Queen's University, Kingston, has investigated these native legends. And you ask them, and you question them, and you think maybe serpents are snakes. But when you talk to them about serpents, they'll tell you that serpents are not snakes. Tales of these unlikely lake monsters have persisted here for centuries. Terrified, Native Americans refer to them as pond devils or swimming demons. What were these tribal members seeing? Is it possible that these stories of the swimming demons can be explained by a giant eel? There are about 600 species of eels in the world. They are fierce carnivores with a notoriously indiscriminate appetite, preferring live fish and large invertebrates. Most eels possess a highly developed sense of smell to track their prey. With their serpent-like heads, slimy bodies, cold, beady eyes, and razor-sharp teeth, the eel is a creature reviled and feared by some. Although not common, eels have even been known to attack humans. In April 2005, British tourist Matt Butcher was diving off the Similan Islands in Thailand when a moray eel latched onto Butcher's left thumb. Once the eel bit into his flesh, Butcher was powerless to get it off. Within seconds, the powerful jaws and needle-like teeth had sliced through the skin, bone, and cartilage. Castleman is the first to admit that even after a century of research, biologists still know very little about eels. Eels are very interesting and in any ways, many ways very mysterious because we've never seen a spawning eel. They're a very ancient fish. They're among the most ancient fish. The largest and most ferocious of the species are all oceanic eels. And although Castleman doubts the existence of a 30-foot-long eel living in a lake, he cannot say with certainty that it could not occur. 
Every now and then we hear of, of, of stories of gigantic eels occurring in fresh water. And, uh, and there's some really well-documented observations of these. One of these sightings was by a man who has decades of experience with the native North American eel. I've been fishing since the late 50s. I started with eels, so it kept going from there. And the first thing I knew, I was in the eel fishing business. John Rorabeck is a commercial eel fisherman on Lake Ontario. The fish is considered a delicacy in Europe and Asia. It's a profitable catch. In 1974, Rorabeck was fishing with his father on Lake Ontario and claims that he encountered an eel of gigantic proportions. After a long day fishing for eels, Rorabeck caught sight of a massive shape coming towards him in the water. Well, when it come to me, I was in moss, so all I could see was a big hump coming. So I dropped on top of him like that. I was going to flip him in the boat. As Rorabeck attempted to catch hold of the creature, it reared up and was strong enough to lift the man out of the water. He just hoisted me in the air. He went right on underneath me. He was too big. Rorabeck fought to wrestle with the large, slippery creature. And he turned around and come back. And when he come back, I got on him again. This time, my whole body. But whatever the creature was, it was too strong. He just slid right on through, just shoved me in the air. There's no way was you going to hold that thing. It was monstrous. It's, it, it, to see something like that, it, it's like something you think you look in a, in a movie, you know? The incident left Rorabek shaken. Whatever it was that he encountered that night, he knew that it didn't belong in these waters. It wasn't the North American eel. The only other eel that I know is that any, anywhere near that size is the conger. But conger eels do not inhabit freshwater lakes. They can tip the scales at 200 pounds and have been known to measure over 12 feet in length. They are terrifying and voracious night predators. Locking their incredibly strong jaws onto their prey, they twist and turn their bodies like a screw, ripping away chunks of flesh. And although the conger is exclusively an ocean eel, Rorabeck's suggestion may make more sense than it seems. The thing that's unique and interesting about congers is from time to time, we see eels in fresh water that are gigantic eels. These were eels that were two meters, more than two meters long, six, seven feet long, uh, you know, uh, eight, 10 inches in diameter and truly gigantic. 800 miles downriver from where Rorabeck had his encounter in Lake Ontario, the island of Newfoundland in eastern Canada guards the entrance to the St. Lawrence Estuary. It's here, at Crescent Lake, that locals say the granddaddy of such creatures has been sighted for centuries. Ever since I was a kid, I always, you know, always heard stories. Effie Colborn has lived on the lakeside for more than 32 years. She says many of the older generation told of something menacing in the lake. I believed it because all the older folks were reliable people. At certain times, they would see, okay, they'd have a sighting of, they called it a monster, so. There have been numerous sightings here over the past 100 years, and the legendary stories from Lake Crescent continue to emerge. One such account from the 1980s told of Royal Canadian Mounted Police divers searching for the corpse of a drowning victim. As the scuba divers braved the murky waters, they found themselves surrounded by a school of vicious eels said to be as thick as a man's thigh. The massive creatures then attacked the divers who quickly swam to the surface to escape. There's a problem with the story. The Royal Canadian Mounted Police have no record of such an attack. Still, many legends bear a kernel of truth. In this case, it's the sightings that date back to ancient times. Even so, this man is skeptical of the existence of Cressy, the nickname given to the monster by locals. It's not likely that there's something unknown to science in these waters. After years spent investigating the lake monsters of North America, author and researcher Joe Nickel believes that Lake Crescent's monster is more local legend than scientific fact. He believes it's self-perpetuating. 
someone sees something and they tell a story and pretty soon it's almost a badge of honor if you've seen it. Nickel will offer up his own explanations and will perform an experiment to test whether the sightings can be explained away as mere optical illusion. 20 to 30. Meanwhile, a forensic sketch artist will produce the first images of the lake monster and analyze the startling consistency between the many witness sightings. If a professional sketch reveals that different people are seeing the same detail, it could suggest that what they are seeing is very real. An eel, three times longer than the largest documented specimen lurking in the waters of Lake Crescent. Waters that marine biologist Richard Hadrich will search employing traps, sonar, divers, and submersible technology. Most of my experience is, is working in the ocean and particularly in the deep sea. I'm a firm believer that there's plenty out there that, uh, that we don't, don't know about. Now, Richard Hadrich is determined to find what would be the greatest discovery of his career, a monster eel. So I guess what we'll want to do now, just head down the middle of this, of the East Basin here. There's trout in this lake, and there's salmon, and there's what we call salmon peel, you know. Yeah, but there are, but there are eels. Oh, yeah, eels. there's eels there, yeah. Honey eels there. Local fisherman and expedition pilot Alwyn Rideout has lived on the shores of this lake his whole life. When you hear stories like this, and particularly ones that go back a, a long ways, they, they had their foundation in something. So that the idea that, that something could, could be in here of, of large size and quite mysterious is, uh, is not at all surprising. The local topography suggests an extremely deep body of water. Lake Crescent is nearly as mysterious as the monster that locals say inhabit it. Although there are no depths indicated in the lake, people have told us that it's virtually bottomless. Will Lake Crescent finally give up its darkest secret? What is that thing? Can you tell? You saw it, didn't you? The people of Robert's Arm in eastern Canada claimed to have seen an extraordinary and terrifying beast, rumored to be over 20 feet long. I think people think you're crazy. <laughs> if I am, I still saw it. <laughs> Effie Colborn is not the only witness. In the past two decades, there have been at least a dozen sightings. I was just uh, appalled at, at what I saw. <laughs> My wife and I were, were driving, and uh, I, I've got a tendency to, to always look in the lake. What Fred Parsons saw in July 1991 was astonishing. Lo and behold, there was the creature just laying on the water. So that's when I backed up and uh, I don't know, I, I would say I observed it for 30 to 40 seconds. I was shocked, I was dumbfounded. I, I, I just couldn't believe it, you know. It wasn't moving in the water, but it was, it had this tendency to, to be vibrating. And consequently, there was a number of low profile waves and ripples emanating from its body all around. I mean, I, estimated it to be between 15 and 20 feet long. I'm convinced that what I saw was uh, some kind of a giant eel. That's the way I'd describe it. The Lake Crescent eyewitnesses are about to undergo their first real test. If you see a creature like this in the lake, your emotion will be quite high. So you will store that information in the that very, very special place in your, in your brain. Michel Fournier, a forensic sketch artist, is more used to working with victims of crimes. But for him, 
the principle is exactly the same. Due to a lack of photographic evidence, Fournier will sketch the monster based on detailed recollections of witnesses. You need to enter somebody else's mind and extract that information. But first of all, you need to establish if that person is telling the truth. So there was those small waves emanating from all around his body. That thing is not moving. No, the thing. Uh, except the, uh, the uh, shivering. Except the shivering, the okay. shivering motion, exactly. Fournier's intensive training allows him to deduce from questioning whether the eyewitness is reliable. This thing was round, uh, Fred, not flat. It was round. Exactly. It's a, a rounder snout. I'll call it a, a little rounder snout here at the. After two hours' work, Fournier lets the witness see his final sketch. Is there any change you want me to? No. No. That, that's right. Okay. Okay. So on a scale of one to ten. I'm going to rate it at at least a nine. Okay. That's good. That's good. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, Richard Haydrich is trying to get a better understanding of Lake Crescent and makes an interesting discovery. You can tell that, that certainly the deepest places are going to be hard by those cliffs and then down uh, along there. Then there's a connection to the lake through this river where there are no prominent waterfalls. It provides very good access to the sea. Eels traditionally spawn in the salt water of the Sargasso Sea, an elongated region in the middle of the North Atlantic Ocean. But exactly where in this region remains a mystery. It, it's very unique because we have never seen a spawning eel. They leave the fresh water and, and go to the ocean. And when they go to the ocean, uh, uh, the only time that we know that uh, they've been successful is their young are starting to swim back by, by way of the Gulf Stream. It's a pattern of behavior that goes back 250 million years to the time of Pangaea the supercontinent that existed prior to the continent splitting into their current configuration. Eels evolved probably 125 million years ago. We know that they uh, survived continental drift. In other words, they lived in the ocean and started to use fresh waters before the continents divided. Is it possible that this ancient species, at home in both fresh and salt water, might have spawned a monster still living in Lake Crescent? If so, then modern technology like side scanning sonar might help find the beast. What this is called is a, it's, it's called a fish. Uh, and, and what it is something is that you tow uh, along and it has little uh, echo sounders basically in, built into the sides of it. So what this does, it'll look at the bottom of things where things might like to hang out, sit around. How deep do you have there? 69. 69, OK, yeah. The sonar images show the areas that should be explored further with divers and submersible cameras. Plenty of water, maybe 80 feet? 70. 70. 79. But OK. The, but the bottom is very rough there. It's showing it rough. Well, it, uh, what I, that's probably a lot of rocks. It's going to be a very interesting place to dive and have a look at. This is just right here. Eels are known to hide in dark crevices and deep waters. The sonar images show that this could be an ideal habitat. There's kind of a little basin in between us and the cliff and the cliff face. Right on. So there's a rock ridge that's running underneath us that goes up here. So this is a real good place. These are going to provide caves and uh, ledges and overhangs and that sort of thing, which would be a, which would be good shelter particularly for a, for a large eel. A baited crab trap is used to attract the attention of whatever lives at the bottom of Lake Crescent. 
this is the area where most of the, of the sightings of any of these mysterious creatures have, have been. In a lake that's only six miles long, a few herring can go a long way, especially for the highly refined senses of a giant eel. An eel can smell a herring a thousand miles away. They really can. They, they are extremely sensitive. Hadrich is hoping that an easy prey will lure the monster to this spot. And Joe Nickel examines a strange set of photos that could explain the lake beast. No question, it's, if it's an eel, it's huge. The residents of Robert's Arm on the coast of Newfoundland in northeastern Canada are convinced their lake is home to a monster eel that the local media has dubbed Cressy. But Joe Nickel, as he examines the evidence, is skeptical. He's an investigator of cryptids, creatures whose existence has been reported but not scientifically proven. I have here a series of photographs, and this certainly, this first photograph could be a very long, um, very gigantic eel, as far as one could tell from the photograph. It's, it's obviously long, curved, um, snake-like. Uh, you can see from some idea of the surrounding rock and so forth that it's, this is not just a little, something little, but it's, it's, it's sizable. Here we see a, a, where the animal's body is very flexible, and it, it looks like a, an arch or, or a hump. In the water, we sometimes uh, hear something having a series of these as if it's moving. Very snake-like, very serpentine. No question, this is a living living creature. It's, if it's an eel, it's certainly eel-like and it's huge. Uh, then we see in the next photo, a dramatic shift. We see now that we can see two creatures and we begin to, they begin to look familiar to us otters. Uh, here it is, um, furry and not looking so sleek and wet and flexible, but this is the same creature. River otters are rare but not unknown in the area around Robert's Arm. Could locals have misidentified this lake monster? Here's a classic sea serpent lake monster type of uh, drawing, and yet if we look closer, if we could, uh, if we were the eyewitness and could peer underwater and see what were actually the case, we see that this is a separate animal. This is a separate animal, and we recognize them now as otters. And it's like a magician's illusion. It's an optical illusion of sorts. It's a misperception. Whatever skeptics say, locals are sure that what they are seeing are not otters or anything else known to man. I definitely saw a head and a body. Whatever it was, it was real. In 1995, Effie Colborn had the longest sighting of the creature yet. She watched the monster cross the lake for more than 15 minutes. I was just more or less in deep thought and uh, the movement just, when I just glanced and the movement caught my eye. I went and to the window. Kind of, I saw the head as it was kind of long featured and, uh, and the body and when it swam, it was like a swell. There was no waves on either side, it was just a deep swell. I watched it for about 15, 20 minutes because the lake is long and I watched it till it went into sight. I, I surmised at the time that it was probably 20 to 30 feet and it could have been longer. The description you're giving me. Forensic artist Michel Fournier attempts to translate Effie's account into an accurate image. Uh, any, any time out. Well, at the beginning, I said you know, what came to my mind, like a horse's head, but it was not as big as a horse's head. It was more, more slim and more pointy, but that's, that's the first thought when I saw the head. I, Look at the sketch. What do you think? Do you think that it looks like the uh, the, the, the shape of uh, of the yes head? Yeah. Yes, it, it kind of looked like this. Yes, it is. Yeah. Anything you want to change or 
add or? No. No? No. You're happy with this? Yes. Okay. Back on the lake, the Monster Quest expedition adds some new technology to its arsenal. Well, we're, we're up to the second day now, and uh, we've added a bunch of, of new pieces of gear, which are very exciting to have. We, one of them is a sonar, not unlike the side scan sonar that we used yesterday, but it's going to be much higher resolution. And in conjunction with that, we have an ROV, which is a wonderful little instrument. With this instrument, we hope, that perhaps we might have actually be able to see Cressy at some point today. Okay, we're connected and secure. Richard Van de Voort has been working with underwater robotics for over 25 years. He has piloted remote operated vehicles in many dangerous environments, from oil rigs to shipwrecks. But this is his first at Lake Crescent. So for today's exercise, we have our video array eyeball ROV, which is dual camera, color pan and tilt camera in the front, black and white stationary camera in the back. Uh, visibility is always a problem with operating ROVs. Um, we do have our avoidance sonar, which we deployed earlier. That allows us basically to see in the dark, so if there are any objects there, we can pick them up on sonar first. That will give us a target to fly over to with the vehicle. Grab her open. With an ability to go as deep as 1,000 feet, the ROV is the perfect way to investigate rocky outcrops, caves, and crevices where bottom-dwelling eels are most likely to be found, including possibly a mammoth species that shouldn't be here. The idea of a conger eel, which is one of the largest of eels and does occur in the salt water here, coming up and occasionally making its home here is perfectly, is, is believable for sure, you know. It gets lost, and this happens a, a lot in the ocean. The conger eel is a fearsome creature. They can weigh up to 200 pounds and are known by fishermen for their terrifying fighting power. They will eat anything that moves and are strong enough to take down seabirds and aquatic mammals. Their razor-sharp teeth and huge jaws easily crushing through bone and crustaceans. Heydrich has a plausible theory for how a displaced conger could grow to monstrous proportions. What happens instead of some of the food energy that it gets having to go into reproduction, uh, it, can, it can all go into growth. And so these things can grow and get very large. A 30-foot conger could reach half a ton, easily capable of overcoming and devouring a full-grown man, leaving no trace of its victim. All right then, Phil, whenever you're ready. Okay. The Monster Quest expedition crew is about to see for the first time into the deepest reaches of Lake Crescent. For nearly a century, the residents of Robert's Arm in eastern Canada have spoken of a monster that lurks in majestic Lake Crescent. Described as serpentine, but larger than any known eel, some believe it could be a displaced ocean dweller. The Monster Quest expedition crew have captured something on their ROV camera. You're down to the bottom and the 50 bottom. feet. Yeah. Okay. Now, just sticks lying there or actual trails. I, they, they look to me like trails. Something's made these little tracks. Now we can't see anything right at the moment, except when you see that stuff. Now, it's eels, that is. It, uh, it could be. I mean, there's not a lot of candidates that uh, would make those tracks. There, they are, they're, they're small tracks. Well, there's a big one. There's another one right there. There's something. What the heck was that? That's oh, that's the tether, tether line. Tether. Yeah, OK. Once the waters settle, Hadrich wonders if the trails could be typical lake bottom disturbances. 
A closer look shows strange patterns emerging from the murk, as if something heavy has slithered along the lake floor. It's very familiar to people that look at bottom photographs all the time to see tracks all over the bottom, usually made by crabs and snails and things like that. I think that this looks like a lattice work of sticks to me. Meanwhile, investigator of cryptids Joe Nickel wants to put eyewitness claims to the test. So we're going to take this out in the middle of the lake, anchor it, and then ask the eyewitnesses to guesstimate the length of it. And we'll see if they're able to do that at an unknown distance. The log seems a good idea. It's, it's a natural object. It's something that people would see in a lake and sometimes do mistake for lake monsters. People make estimates, but they really don't usually have any frame of reference. They're just, it's an impression. If there's something next to it, a rock of known size or a boat or something, then you, you would have some scale. Nickel anchors the log in the center of the Eastern Basin, the location of most of the Cressy sightings. As Nickel gathers the eyewitnesses for the experiment, Richard Haydrich and the team have found an excellent spot to search for an oversized and hungry eel. My belief is that, that any animal is, is never going to go very far from where it can get something to eat. And the best place in here is where the lake narrows, chokes down to that, that little narrow entrance at the, at the bridge. And there were fish jumping, there, were, there was a loon, uh, there were all kinds of, of, of things going on. So that, that for my money, is, is where you want to look for something that, that's that is probably out looking for a meal. And to find it, the ROV is sent back into the murky water. Oh, Whoa, right there. Yes. more of that soft stuff. Yes. Look at this soft, look at all this soft sediment. Yes. Hard to That's say. something for the divers to have a look at and see what the heck that really is. I mean, it's all a lot of structure in that. Yeah, right. A lot of structure. See these little holes yeah. and things? The eel. The soft bottom of the lake would provide excellent coverage for an eel waiting to ambush its next victim. The massive disturbances on the lake's floor grab Hadrich's attention. That, that, that looks like a bunch of bones. See them? Like that? Big eels. Big eels down in there. Yeah. With some intriguing targets to explore, the divers prepare to go head to head with whatever's hiding down in Lake Crescent. OK, so we make this the divers right at the moment. We'll see what happens on the sweep back. We've been pointing the position where the divers are. Now, those are two men. And basically, you've got a relatively small dot you know, because they're only about two meters long or two meters high. If you had a large animal that was, say, 10, 15, 20 meters long, it would cover two or three of the bar, the, the range indicators on the screen, all right? It would be, compared to that dot, it would be five, six, seven, eight, ten times longer. The water is just above freezing and visibility is less than three feet. As the divers swim along the bottom, something looms in the distance. It's a branch. So far, no signs of any food source. The bottom is a barren landscape, and yet they see something else. A place to hide. another place to hide. I was very concerned for the safety of the cameraman. Support diver Robert Linfield knows that uncharted lakes can be treacherous. As we swam along the bottom and approached any object, it was invisible, and then all of a sudden it was there. The entire lake is a complete hiding spot because where the water is so black, 
the, the creature could be, you know, within feet of the surface and you could pass over it in a boat and never see it. The footage they bring back is worth the effort. It's wonderful to see these logs that are all, they're all cut, cut wood. They're not things that have fallen in there. And so they might well be left over from the logging days. Just lots of sort of nooks and crannies, but a very inhospitable place, basically. It looks like a rock. But for Joe Nickel, the log-strewn lake bed suggests another case of misidentification. Given the uh, amount of logs at the bottom of the lake, it's possible for, over time, for due to the rotting of the log to produce methane gas, and this makes the log buoyant. And at the surface, it can uh, uh, rock back and forth or bob, at which point it loses the methane and the log sinks again. Could Fred Parsons' vibrating eel-like creature be a log rolling at the surface of the water? The rising and sinking log effect is roughly demonstrated by this old science experiment where we're putting a mothball into some carbonated water. And as you see, it quickly becomes uh, coated with bubbles and rises to the top. Now the bubbles should uh, hopefully dissipate, uh, whereupon we're going to expect, as it loses bubbles, it rolls, it's animated, it's alive. Back on the lake, the Monster Quest team is about to discover there may be something in Lake Crescent and it's big enough to drag a 40-pound crab trap. We, we came up alongside the buoy, and we'd set it down off the point there, so, uh, so something moved it around. Native legends and historical accounts describe sea serpents all along the eastern seaboard. Biologists suggest that a stray, infertile conger eel could grow into a monster. Is Newfoundland, Canada home to a record-setting creature? This woman watched for 15 minutes as an undulating monster made its way across Lake Crescent. This man is convinced that the mystery lake creature he saw was real. This fisherman saw what he thought was a 20-foot-long giant eel. Michel Fournier, a forensic artist, creates the first images of the monster based on detailed recall of the eyewitnesses. And Joe Nickel is putting the locals through a test of perception. I'd like to try a little experiment with you if I can. What we're gonna do is we are gonna see if you are able to guess at the size of something in the water. It's an unknown distance, unknown object, and we'll see how well you do. Okay? Okay. Yeah. Okay. So we're gonna stand, I think, right here is a good view. I want you to say how long you think that is. What do you think? Oh, well, I think it's probably 20 feet. 20 feet? Mm -hmm. Okay. 20 feet. That's perfect. Now we'll. How long do you think that that is? 20 to 30 feet. 20 to 30, okay. So as I say is 18 feet long. Okay. Okay, the real distance is, the real length is, actually, you know, you did not so bad. It's 14 feet, three inches. They did overestimate this size. Um, I think that's almost always the case. And people tend, if they see something alive and alarming or, or really rare and wonderful, the size, I think, gets magnified by some factor. However, two of the estimates were within six feet of the actual length, 
showing that the eyewitness recollections of a monster or creature up to 30 feet long may have been accurate. Hadrich and the Monster Quest team returned to the crab trap. Earlier, the crab trap was baited with herring and attached to a buoy to offer an enticing meal to the creature. Suspicions are immediately raised when they realize the trap has been moved. We, we came up alongside the buoy and we set it down off the point there and expected to go right back to it. Uh, but it seems to have moved down here. So, uh, so something moved it around. It wasn't very windy at all last night. And in fact, this morning it was flat calm. It's a pretty heavy trap and it's gonna take something pretty big to shift that uh, around. That in this real deep water where there are no currents or anything, it has moved, what would you say, 200 feet? 200 feet or, or, or more. The ROV is used to check whether anything has disturbed or damaged the trap. 30 feet. How deep is it here? 40 feet. We think it's about 100. About 100. Now, that, now we're coming right to the trap. That's the line off the top of the trap. Oh, OK. That's a good jump. And uh, so you're going to see that you're going to see the trap in just a just a very short distance. That's it. There's there. the trap. Oops. And this is why we're seeing all the turbulence, because we're towing the trap. Look at that. And there's the herrings, and nothing's been at them. <laughs> that we got a real good look at the trap. And we saw it from the top and from the bottom because it was tipped over a little bit as by, the, by the boat itself. And uh, what we could see was that the herring were in fine shape. Nothing had been in there munching away at them or eating out, eating out a part of them or anything. The untouched trap is a disappointment, but then they see something moving across the bay. What is that thing? Can you tell? Whatever it is, it's not visible on the surface, but it's producing a foot-long wake. Well, it was a mysterious creature swimming along. I don't know. I don't know. You saw it, didn't you? There it is, right there. That's a beaver. Did you get him? Going across towards the rock, right in the still area. Yeah, I got her. It's too bad, it's a beaver. <laughs> it's quite a mysterious place down here. But Michel Fournier, forensic artist, concludes that his sketches do depict something real. I believe that we are all dealing with the same, same creature. The clarity of the witness recollections and consistencies in their descriptions are difficult to dismiss. Details in the size, movement, and shape of the creature are unwaveringly similar. The three person I met today definitely saw something in that lake. And the Monster Quest expedition reluctantly packs up. If I'd gotten a sonar target, then I'd, I'd go to court tomorrow. Certainly, if we could spend a lot more time, get a little more hardware out here, uh, I think if there was something to be found, I'm, I'm confident I could find it. I really am. The mystery behind the creature of Lake Crescent will remain just that. Whether it is an oversized conger eel that has lost its way, a sunken log, or as witnesses believe, truly a monster. There's a kind of person who loves a mystery and wants it kept a mystery. They do not want an explanation. And for those people, this will continue. Um, I saw something in the water. I don't know what it was, so it must have been a lake monster. And you can't draw a conclusion from I don't know. You know, it, well, I seen it, and that's all you could do. You, you can't, you know, it was there. No doubt, it was there. For some, they, they believe. Others are still, are doubters, you know. But uh, to me, I, 
I believe what I saw. I, I, I strongly believe in what I saw.